Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. I greet you all with the peace and blessings of Allah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. I'm honored to be here with all of you today among men and women whose compassion for the welfare of humanity has compelled them to leave their homes and sacrifice their time so that they can be here on this Saturday for what will insha'Allah be a thought-provoking and action-inspiring conference. I'm honored to be here with Dr. Altaf Hussein, Imam Zaid Shakir, Dr. Marva Kavakche, and Mrs. Anya Kurdel, who have taught me what it means to be sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your work and who are a testimony to the achievements that altruism can create by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, we live at a time that will be recorded as one of the most profound moments in human history in terms of its impact in charting the course for the future. I would argue that the period in which we currently live shares certain similarities to the period in which the Prophet ﷺ and the early companions found themselves. As the Prophet ﷺ attested, بَدَأَ الْإِسْلَامُ غَرِيبًا وَسَيَعُودُ غَرِيبًا فَطُوبَ لِلْغَرَبَاءِ that Islam began as a stranger and will one day return as a stranger. And so may those who are strangers, al-ghuraba, be in a state of exalted happiness. Just as Islam sat on trial 1400 years ago, Islam again sits on trial and everyone associated with it has become inevitably incriminated. As Islam bashing has become a favorite pastime for radio show talk, ho for radio show talk hosts, syndicated columnists, politicians, and even a few fundamentalist Christian leaders, its, its consequences have manifest, manifested in the increasing rate of suspicion and discrimination towards Muslims. As we are confronted with an increasing level of suspicion, fear, and even hatred, how do we respond? And I would answer this by posing another question. How would the Prophet Wasallam have responded? I think this is a common theme we heard in the three talks by the earlier speakers, that let's return to the roots of Islam, to the essence of Islam. We must revive our understanding of the seerah of the Prophet We have unfortunately reduced the seerah to legends from the past, finding security and solace in their shattered remnants in belonging to something that once was, yet forgetting that we are capable to make it be once again. We must understand that the Prophet's one and unwavering mission was only to guide the hearts of the people to the tr truth of their existence, to awaken their dormant belief in the oneness of their creator, and to give their lives purpose and meaning. And I just want to rem remind us, as the speakers mentioned, that the Prophet ﷺ, that there is no room, there was no room for vengeance. Vengeance was never the purpose of Islam, and those who sought vengeance were never allowed to compromise or override the spirit of mercy and compassion that characterizes the essence of Islam. If we remember during the conquest of Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ removed Sa'd ibn Ubadah from the position of leadership, took away the flag from him for the mere a suggestion for the mere implications of his words when he said Al -yawm, yawm al that today would be the day of slaughter the Prophet وسلم, removed him immediately from the position of leadership and said Bal al -yawm, yawm al but today is a day of mercy uh, inshallah as we begin I'm going to first ask Mrs. Anya Kurdel to um, say a few opening uh, statements and then we will open the floor for questions for the speakers inshallah Thank you so much. Um, I am extraordinarily honored to be here today. And I was beyond moved when I came in this morning and saw that this conference is giving an award to my friend, Ray Spuyan, who I've spoken to on the phone many, many times, but I've never met in person. And I, I was stunned to think that I was going to get that opportunity today. So I, I'm, I'm so thrilled to be here on so many counts. I discovered the conference, and the conference discovered me at the 11th hour. So all of the slots were filled with the wonderful speakers that you've already heard and will hear, so you don't hear my presentation. But they were very, very gracious, and they printed my article, Where the Anti-Muslim Path Leads, in the center of the program that you have. So you're going to have to do a do-it-yourself 
version of my program and um, find out more about my work. And um, if you go online and you look at the bio, that's where the links are to how to find me and contact me. And I hope that you do because I think it's so important for us to work together uh, around this horrible issue that, that we're trying to address. So um, let me just say, if you didn't catch somewhere in that introduction, that I am Jewish, and, and that does play a tremendous part in the reason that I'm doing the work that I'm doing. If you read that article in the center, um, you'll read much more about my background in history and how I came to be so passionate about the work that I do. And I, I want to read one of the comments that, that followed that article when it was posted on Islamophobia Today. I hope you all know who Anne Frank is. And if you don't, you can Google her and you'll see thousands and thousands and thousands of listings. And, and, and if you read her diary, which if you haven't read, it's very, very powerful and important to read, then you'll know who I'm referring to. But I, I assume most of you do now. So the, the comment is, the author really nails this. The next Anne Frank, hiding in an, in an attic in Amsterdam, will be wearing a hijab. And it won't be from a foreign invading army, but from the locals. And that's a very terrifying, but possibly, um, maybe, maybe that's true. Maybe that is the direction that we're heading. Sometimes it, it feels that way. There's also a very, very hateful, vicious, um, genocidal comment on that website. This woman is a repugnant Jew who would get raped just like Lara Logan did if she was in a Muslim country. She is worse than the Muslim dung that the rest of us abhor and should burn in hell for Muslim apologist views. America will not be safe until Islam is banned and all Muslims are gone. And I know, I know that this kind of a comment is no surprise to any of you. I know that we see vast numbers of such comments. And that's really terrifying to me. And we've seen in history how this can play out. And Jews certainly have seen in history how this can play out. What's going on right now is not a Muslim problem. It's a human problem. It's impacted Sikhs and Hindus and many, many other people, people of color. Um, we saw in Utoya in Norway how it's impacted people who were accused of being multiculturalists. It impacts good Christians who are working against it. It impacts many people, and it impacts the people who are the perpetrators, such as Mark Stroman and the other people who are doing this. It is damaging them as human beings. It's a human problem. And Frank lived long enough to write her diary because of the non-Jewish supporters who helped her family survive for the two years before she and her family went off to a concentration camp or dragged off to concentration camps where she died. We have to build alliances across the gulfs that divide us. That's the only way we're going to deal with this, with this problem. And I'm going to, to go to give this microphone back, but in the afternoon at the panel, I'll have also a few moments. And I want to say then a little bit about strategies and initiatives that I, that I think we could work on together, which I think is the most important thing that we have to do. Thank you very much. I have a question for the panelists from the audience. A lot of effort is put into defending Muslims from bigotry by painting us as peace-loving, etc. Sometimes it feels there's no space to talk about U.S. foreign policy, U.S. foreign and labor policy, structural racism or imperialism. How do we get past this sense of stuckness? This was a, a message from the uh, audience. I think that everyone up here has addressed those issues, as they say, uh, there's a proper word to be said in every situation. I think the important thing for us is to understand that in addressing those issues, imperialism, uh, some of the uh, negative uh, aspects of American foreign policy, the entrenched and increasingly uh, influential uh, militarism and the, the um, 
military uh, interests, industrial interests that uh, even as far back as Dwight uh, Eisenhower were, were identified and their influence on, in our society, it's important for us to, to not be caught up into cycles of hate, vengeance, uh, bigotry, and and to lose our compassion. And this is happening with, with uh, many Muslims in many parts of the world. I think it's very important, yes, to recognize there is uh, a, an arena where those things have to be addressed. But as uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Anya Cornell, uh, Cor Cordell was mentioning, that has to be a broad-based uh, platform if it's going to be affected, effective. Many of us uh, are, are used to being entertained, and one aspect of that entertainment is we get up and rah-rah and condemn everything and down with this and down with that, but we don't do anything to begin to, to develop the functional basis of, of strength that allow us to effectively begin to change some of those realities. So it's certainly important that we talk about these issues, it's certainly important that we uh, way, uh, point the finger of condemnation where it needs to be point, pointed, but it's more important that we build the alliances that are necessary to, to be and do the hard work that's not glamorous and it doesn't involve the limelight and it's not the things that get posted on blogs, but it's things that are done quietly and consistently in the background to build the strength we need to move forward and to address uh, the sources of a lot of that violence and a lot of those things that, that we rightfully uh, could depre deprecate. And it's even more importantly that we not become bitter and that we not become hopeless and that we not become desperate because bitterness, hopelessness, and desperation, that's the breeding ground for the discarding of fundamental rights and fundamental considerations that should always guide our action, and it leads us to doing the things you see now, people going into masjids. There are places in our ummah today, people are afraid to go to the masjid because they don't know if the person next to them has a bomb strapped to their body and is going to blow everyone up. There are people who are afraid to go to the marketplaces. There are places where people are afraid to leave their home. Uh, I know very quickly, I said too much, this is a panel, but I'm going to shut up for the next 10 minutes, inshallah. A friend of mine, Faiz Ahmed, was in the intercontinental in Afghanistan, in Kabul, when it was attacked by a group of people who identified themselves with Islam. He was in one of the rooms, and the, the explosions and the shootings were getting closer and closer. He's a doctoral studi student. Uh, he was doing PhD research on the intersection of constitutionalism and Sharia in the early 21st, uh, 20th century, a comparative study between the declining Ottoman Empire and the emerging Afghan nation state. He has seen the, the videos, some of which were shown on Al Jazeera, where people with turbans and shawar khamis were gunning down an, the 80-year-old receptionist at the hotel who was begging for mercy gunning down people with their fellow Muslims, with their hands raised and in surrender, unarmed. And, and that's the kind, those are the kind, the ability to get into that space, that is the fruit of bitterness, and that is the fruit of desperation, and that is the fruit of hopelessness, and that is the fruit of a politics that doesn't see itself capable of realistically addressing the problem, so we move into the realm of terror. So it's important, but we have to look at the big picture. Sorry for that long answer. If I may add a few things to where uh, uh, Sheikh uh, Zaid Shakir has left off. Uh, I think going back to your original question, uh, what we need to do is to follow uh, a contemporaneous processes that need to take place at the same time at parallel dimensions. Both are have to do with having a critical insight within ourselves and without. 
The without part might uh, really be applicable to the question about foreign affairs. But as far as ourselves is concerned, and I think what I will be suggesting will be uh, a panacea, somewhat of a panacea to the example that uh, Shakir uh, Sheikh uh, has uh, uh, provided for us, that is to go back. We're often uh, accused of being backward and reactionary and parochial and narrow-minded people, people who belong to seventh century, right? Uh, I think we literally need to go back, back to our originality, to our sources, and re-Islamize ourselves, relearn Islam anew as if it's a clean page. Uh, the fact that we are uh, somewhat um, uh, inflicted with uh, the additions, shall I say, omissions over the centuries, uh, uh, intertwined to cultural values, traditions, most of whom might be antithetical to the very core values of Islam, has made us go astray away from Islam. So we need to look in and re-Islamize ourselves. That's one of the processes that I promote, at least for myself. Uh, the second one is a look outside. The inalienable rights bestowed upon us by God, which make the very fundamental core values of this society, is to have it promotes us to have a critical insight and, and approach to anything and everything with a certain reservation and suspicion. American foreign policy is an area that we can approach with, with a critique. There's nothing wrong with that. I think Muslims, American Muslims, must not be sequestered, appeased, but speak the truth at all times. For America, for Europe, for Middle East, for Far East, for all of the globe. Thank you. I want to follow up with a question. I know the speakers have been pushing us to have a very introspective and honest uh, conversation. And I think many of us here in this room have has experienced a conversation, having a conversation with a non-Muslim about Islam's ideals of value, compassion, and mercy when that person will turn around and cite one incident after the other, legi le legitimate incidents involving Muslims throughout the world that reflect the complete opposite of those values that reflect intolerance, oppression, and even violence, as Imam Zaid mentioned in his example. How do we as Muslims reconcile this apparent inconsistency between Islamic ideals and between the behavior of Muslims when we are, um, throughout the world? And does this inconsistency undermine our credibility as Muslims when we are calling for others to show more tolerance and respect towards us as religious minorities in the West. Are you now? Yes. All right, um, I mean, you know, this is like an endless um, uh, cycle. I was um, at, a, at a church and uh, there was a talk on Islam and it seemed like a very good reception. And at the end of it, I hadn't even seen the news, but this man had seen a news story where by some woman had been set fire in Saudi Arabia, and then he wanted me to say, reconcile what I had just presented about Islam with this incident. So the challenge with that cycle is basically that if we get caught up in responding constantly to trying to either justify or explain or react to what is being done by our co-religionists, then essentially we're going to wear ourselves down and psychologically be almost traumatized by the fact that there is this dysfunctionality, there is this pathology among Muslims, and when we come to accept it, it's not a place of weakness. We have to say, yes, this is there. But Allah SWT also says in the Quran, Ya ladina amanu, lima taquluna ma la taf'alun, qabura maqtan andallahi, an taqulu ma la taf'alun. That why is it, O oh you believe, why is it that you say that which you do not do? Despiseful it is to Allah that you say that which you do not do. So I think, so, you know, on the one hand, we can say, you know, we can make excuses for them or whatever, but I'm actually at a point in my life where 
if I spend more energy explaining what is the religion and then living it out, it seems to me to offset at least minimally the person in front of me ranting and raving about this incident, this incident. It's, I mean, I, there is no way, there is no way we can explain some of the actions of people who, who commit those actions under Islam. There's absolutely no way. Because nothing about Islam can be twisted for those evil purposes. So I can say what? It's just, this is an individual action with an individual interpretation for which I find no basis in the teachings of Islam. So you're free to accept that or you're free to malign the actual principles that I just described. And that's the best way to, to end it other than to, you know, in social work, the principle is you begin where the client is. If the client in this case is ignorant, ill-informed, or especially, especially intentionally distorting the teachings, you have to begin where they are by emphasizing the peaceful nature, but then by also saying at some point, this is the religion, and I'm really sorry for the loss that this other person caused in the name of Islam, but this is not Islam. Well, the thing that I'm so aware of, even though the question wasn't directed towards me as a group or a member of a group, um, is why shouldn't that question be directed towards me as a member of a group? Why is that question not being directed towards other members of other groups who are doing exactly the same thing? There, there are individuals who are committing absolute atrocities and and yet you know we are not being tarred with this at this moment in time uh, you know all Jews aren't being tarred the same way all Catholics aren't being tarred the same way all Christians aren't being tarred the same way when Anders Breivik committed his massacre in Norway and um, in that article that's in the program, somebody pointed out to me that it flips open to the middle page and, and there's a headline, uh, a heading w that I wrote and I just wrote the heading white guys. And somebody said, well, that really caught our attention when we saw white guys, when we opened up the program. And, you know, what I'm talking about in that paragraph has to do with that you know, people don't assume that all white guys are the same. And that's, you know, the privilege that that, that group has at this moment. How to, how to contradict that, it seems to me, I think, I, I often talk about how we have to get into one another's lives and living rooms. We have to get to know each other as individuals. And it's great to come to conferences and it's great to, you know, come to interfaith dialogues and, and, and all the many wonderful things that are being done. But it has to go deeper than that. We have to figure out how, the, I think sometimes the hardest bridge to cross is the threshold into somebody else's front door. And, you know, I guess I would challenge everyone here and ask you to, to reflect how many people of other groups have been in your living room? Other, whatever you want to say, other groups, other religions, other ethnicities, other cultures. And how can you get them into your living room? I know it's hard these days. I know it is hard because of, of all of the suspicion and the stereotyping and the profiling. I've somehow, my family and I, we have managed to, to do that and get incredible, you know, diversity, uh, so to speak. In, in, in our own home, in our own lives. And one of the things that I can say for sure is that if you are an ally, you become a friend. So if you can figure out the ways that you can ally with other groups, and there are things that Muslims can be doing to ally with other groups. Certainly, you know, Muslims can reach out to Sikhs who are under tremendous fire by virtue of their attire and say, you know, I'm your ally. I you know, I want to be your friend. There are certainly other, uh, I'm going to talk about more later, but, but those are some of the, the quick things just to say briefly. And just find the little way that you can reach out to somebody and then it expands naturally because the humanity that we share shines through. And once you're in each other's home and, and you're friends, then you start, start to make those changes. 
I think making friendships on the individual level, absolutely, with people of other faith. And here's a related question from the audience. Um, as we know, the Quran reminds us that change must begin internally before it can manifest externally. So what are some specific changes that the Muslim American community need to make in uh, both its discourse and its action? And this person said, um, you know, we all uh, do our individual efforts, but what can we do as a united group? What, what, how can we as a united group do something effective? And this person was asking for some concrete examples. Well, very quickly, uh, in the, in the uh, in the program book, there's a, a plan that we've written with some practical things you can do. You can start with that. Uh, and there are many constructive suggestions, so I would s refer you to that. Assalamu uh, alaikum. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure how to put this uh, in a politically correct uh, vocabulary, but I think one of the things we can do uh, that I see in my observation, both as a person of this land and the Orient, if you will, is to put aside our inferiority complexities. Let's just get over that, please. And know that we're in a country where theoretically speaking, I know we have our issues here, we have our challenges here, but compared to some of the countries that uh, us, either we or our parents or our grandparents have lived, still we have the institutionalized democratic values that we can resort to, we can go and seek refuge in, such as freedom of expression, such as um, freedom of thought, such as freedom of religion. Uh, over the summer, course of the summer, I was in Turkey and I had some visitors from United States of America, one, uh, one of whom uh, was a student at one of the universities here at the metropolitan area. A, a female student, a Muslim female student, came and visited me and shared some of her experiences about Turkey with me. At some point, we, she made this particular comment. I find Islam uh, to be a bit difficult to, to be lived in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, I would have a second thought before I tell my friends that, oh, I have to go to the masjid and pray at her school. I was shocked. There was a generation gap between me and her, obviously, but also there was some other gap in between us. From my own experience, I'm assuming maybe God has uh, thought that uh, I had my own share of troubles in my homeland, so he saved me from having any kind of trouble in the United States vis-a-vis -vis discrimination. Um, I realized that my experience in the United States of America as a free Muslim who has no trouble of assuming the pulpit and speaking, teaching, being a student, being a professor, and uh, being able to go about my life without any discrepancies, if you will, based on hate based on the way I appear. This other Muslim girl, student, a second generation American, a white American Muslim girl, had second thoughts about telling to her friends where she was going to go to pray. This is a problem in us. We must teach our children to have a straightforward head up. They deserve to be treated as good as other people here. We all deserve that. And therefore, I would very much, very much be concerned about uh, seeing ourselves 
uh, having the same rights and liberties and uh, be valued as other people. Thank you. Uh, if I could quickly uh, build on that, uh, and I, w I was wanted to say the same thing, but I was waiting for my 10 minutes to expire. Uh, we have to definitely, as Dr. Merve is mentioning, we have to stop othering ourselves. That this is not, we take shahada even, and it's, it's interesting, she mentioned a convert. So here's a person fully integrated in the society, every sense of the word, uh, with friends, family, relatives, grew up, uh, interest, culture, acculturation becomes Muslim and suddenly she's an other who's hesitant to identify as a Muslim. We, we have to stop that. We have to understand that we're full citizens with full rights and that as a Muslim we have just as much right as anyone and those categories of Darul Islam, Darul Harb, Darul Kufr, all of these categories that we find in the ancient uh, law books, they have no relevance in this new situation of universal full citizenship. So we, we have to understand our reality on the basis of this reality and understand that it's new and unique and that by right of birth, by right of citizenship, we have certain privileges that we should, on the one hand, not surrender and on the other hand, not allow to become the basis by surrendering them of stripping us of our dignity and our identity. We have to stand up for who we are. And in doing that and doing it assertively, we won't, we won't be the first people in American history. And, and even practically speaking, I think the challenge is that I really don't think that we go to bed. You know, the question in America now is always, when someone's running for office, you know, what keeps you up at night? And I'm not convinced fully, and forgive me, that the Muslim community in America really is staying awake at night worrying about our condition or our state. Because if we were, then we would have, hold our leadership accountable. We would hold our organizations accountable. We would be developing new organizations. So in two practical ways, one is at the individual level, we shouldn't run past the fact that the individual is the core, is the foundation, if you will, of the propensity to act. That if we can do that and approach spirituality we talked about, approach muhasaba, some level of self-accountability, saying, well, what am I doing? What is it that moves me? Am I getting a degree towards that cause and then insha inshallah trying to do something about it, write about it, research about it? What, what can I do? But then in that process, I shouldn't become either spiritually arrogant or spiritually extreme. That I shouldn't become to down, look down upon the people around me and say, well, you know, no one is doing it and so I'm just going to alienate myself. No, I have to struggle there. And at the larger level, I think the Muslim community is in dire, dire, desperate need of a Vatican II similar exercise as what the Catholic community did, which means 10 years from now, not today, not tomorrow, we, we keep wanting to rush everything and have it overnight and resolve it, have a conference, resolve it. No, 10 years, intentionally, get every major Muslim country, including the United States and Canada, to say we will send the best of our scholars, our our. our, our our legal scholars, our Islamic scholars, all of them, and every year, every year, they'll just meet once a year for 10 years to start to address how is Islam applied in the 21st century? How are the basic issues of living? And Dr. Tariq Ramadan, may Allah preserve him and protect him, has begun that process of talking about how do we tackle the West and modernity? Because we are not of another place. I have absolutely no uh, way that I would function in India where I was born, but I came at an early age. My children are born here. This is their reality. And if we take it seriously, if we really say we're not going to go for the rushed you know, re recommendation or some resolution, but we're going to make it intentional. Ten years from now, we're going to be able to look back and say every major issue that we should have been addressing on how do you live as a Muslim in this 21st century, anywhere, by the way, anywhere. The problems are starting to, inter you know, uh, to intertwine and, and connect. So it will be, be anywhere. Then we can support them. Then we can say to the scholars, it's okay if you don't come to this one conference to speak this year because it's better that you write. It's better that you sit down with your family and spend some time and get some thinking where you can give us the guidance instead of running around through airport systems, being patted down and insulted and this and that, just to come and speak for a few minutes. And then what do we get? A conference? No, no progress. So I want us to do both. 
I want us to have that intentionality at the individual level, hold ourselves accountable, be concerned about something, hold our organizations accountable, but also then turn and say, let us give them the latitude and the freedom to spend 10 years, if you will, 20 years, if you will, at the end to come up with a way that Muslims will, inshallah, be the leaders with the grace of Allah going forward and not have that inferiority complex, not be always beating ourselves up and in the end being left behind. Jazakallah khair. Um, if we can move sort of to the political climate that we're currently in. Um, you know, as we know, we have pre presidential elections gearing up in the next year, and there's no question that Muslims have become fresh fodder for uh, Muslim baiting Republicans trying to win their party's nomination for a presidential candidate. In the first public debate between the Republican primary candidates, we witnessed the bashing of Islam and Muslims and the marginalization of Muslims at the highest level. You have the likes of Herman Cain making preposterous claims that he would not appoint a Muslim to his cabinet or to the position of federal judge and stating that, quote, a lot of Muslims are not totally dedicated to this country. Yet within a few weeks, uh, Mr. Cain visited the Adams Center, one of the largest mosques here in Northern Virginia, and apologized, stating that he can empathize with the Muslim American community because of his experience with stereotypes and discrimination as an African American. Similarly, you have the likes of Newt Gingrich, who played a key role in setting aside um, a space on Capitol Hill for Muslim congressional staffers to pray each Friday when he was Speaker of the House in the 1990s. Yet now, he has become one of the most vocal Muslim bashers in the race for the Republican pres presidential nomination. He has compared the organizers of the Ground Zero Mosque to Nazis and called for a federal ban on Sharia. Why are Muslims being used as political pawns in the race for office? What has happened in mainstream politics that allows for such bigoted and discriminatory statements? Uh, you know, uh, th this is a, a big issue. Number one, uh, we have to move beyond this if, and present a positive message, organize ourselves, build alliances, uh, strengthen ourselves spiritually and uh, be the the truth that we advocate for and and, and, and represent that and nothing's happened I mean this is old stuff in American politics and in the 1880s it was, was the Chinese and the and the uh, other Asians that culminated in the Chinese exclusion act where you find a weak marginal uh, community you make that community a scapegoat and, and you use it to whip up popular support for certain political uh, groups. It, it's the, it was formerly African Americans, Japanese Americans in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, now it's even more than Muslims, it's uh, the Mexicans and, and Latinos and the anti-immigrant and all of that sentiment. So this is nothing new, nothing has happened, unfortunately, and that's the problem. And I think it's our responsibility to our community and to our nation to begin to present a positive message, to begin to build positive alliances, and to begin to envision those spaces where a new type of politics that's not based on race baiting and xenophobia and all of these traditional sources of political negativity, we create a positive space where, where cooperation, where bridge building, where reconciliation, where sharing and caring and compassion becomes the basis of our political action. And we can't do that if we're obsessed with all of this negativity. In the early community, the Prophet of the Salam is told, leave them people, those people, rather, leave them people. <laughs> I'm saying, uh, leave those people. Dharni wal mukaddibin. Yakiduna kaida wa kidu kaida fa mahilil kafirin and hilhum ruweda. So leave the, the Gingriches of the world. Listen, let God deal with them. And we have to do the positive things that we have to do to make this place better for everyone. And, and if we do that, there'll be less and less people who will serve as an audience for the hatred and the bigotry and the defamation because they'll say, listen, those people fed me, they clothed me, they gave me medical treatment at their free clinic. I don't care what you say, those are some good people. I love me some Muslims. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I do too. <laughs> and, and 
the, on, uh, in extending that point, not to uh, uh, you know, b belabor it, but it is also to say, as the uh, Algerian philosopher uh, Malik bin Nabi said, that the Muslim lands became colonized because at some point we were colonizable. At this point, somebody can say whatever they want, and it's trash, it's just total trash, and Muslims do, can and have not been organized to do anything about it. It begins at the local level, it begins at the city paper, the local dinky little city paper that has the gall to put out an editorial against Islam. Fifty Muslims should show up from that town at the editorial board room and say, we want a meeting with you. How dare you do this? What is the basis for what you're doing? A little cartoon shows up, we should show up. We should encourage our young children, starting with the age of 10, 11, 12, write letters to the editor. Write letters to the editor every time a newspaper has the gall to print something that's defaming and, and, and hateful of Islam and Muslims. And then go to the politicians. So on the on, uh, extending Imam Zaid's point, on the one hand, yes, we could be drained by it. But on the other hand, are we even organized in a way? Do we feel pain when we see it? Or do we just sit there and laugh and say, oh, look at these people? No, we have to sit there and say, you know what? If even one person speaks out against us, then a thousand of us will say, we are offended by this, we will do something, money speaks, so we will stop shopping where you are, we will stop buying your products, we will stop buying your newspapers or go online and look at you. We will make enough noise to say that we are not colonizable and we are not people you can just sit there and, and, and you know, attack. We will respond with uh, wisdom and understanding, but we have to be organized and structured in a way to do so. And I know by the end of inshallah today, most of you, after hearing all of these scholars speak, will be moved to do something about it. Positive, constructive, and inshallah help these politicians say, if you even once speak out something negative with Islam, you can bet you might be elected this time, but your next campaign, you're going to be out of office, and we will show you that you'll be out of office with our vote and with our contributions. Um, I'm sorry to say we're uh, out of time, but as all the speakers have said and left us on a positive note of all the communities, all the Muslim communities in the world, we are really one of the best positioned to make a difference, to vote, to advocate, to lobby, to, to uh, speak our mind. We have, you know, in terms of diversity, education, wealth, freedoms, political freedoms, especially, you know, as we see what's happening across the world. Let's not forget that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has really bestowed us with a great ni'mah and it would be not just a pity but a grave injustice for us to squander these blessings Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us and not stand up and speak the truth and reach out to our neighbor as Ms. Cordell remind us and as inheritors of this great religion we are not driven by the conditions that exist around us but by the unwavering trust in Allah the creator of the heavens and earth we are guided ultimately by the realization that while we make the effort it is God who will produce change. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.